I model for brands that are like, we have representation. And don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for the opportunities that they've allowed me okay. and that they care. But that shouldn't be the exception. That shouldn't be the tagline of a marketing campaign. That should be the norm. To give a little frame uh, of today, we are here to talk about closing the inclusion gap with disability. As the founder of the Valuable 500, last year we made history because we got disability on the main stage of Davos with five of the world's most influential CEOs. And then we launched the Valuable 500, which was to get us like our iconic mission to get 500 of the world's most influential brands and their CEOs with disability on the leadership agenda, to stop disability being on the sidelines of business. Because when business does not see the value of people with disabilities, neither will society. We don't need your pity or your charity. We need you to see that we have value in talent and consumer spending power and innovation. We're an opportunity for growth, brand differentiation. I can go on. But what we see, and I'm so delighted to say at our press conference on Tuesday, which Eddie joined us for, we announced 242 companies. And that's extraordinary. And that represents 3.6 trillion in revenue, 10 million employees, 24 countries and 42 sectors. Now, we say the trigger for this, and the reason that business leaders should be so interested, because you're, they're fascinated by talent and growth, and we have three trigger points. One is the next generation. The second is digital revolution and social media and technology. I swore last year that we had the most famous CEOs in the world sitting on our panel. And this year, I wanted to bring some of the most influential young people <laughs> with lived experience of disability because this is a new generation. It's a new voice. It's at your peril business that you don't engage with it. And I could not be more proud than to have these two wonderful uh, young leaders here with me. We're going to have a really kind of sassy conversation, I think. Um, yeah, we are. And it's a really easy conversation we're going to have. And we're going to just talk a little. I'm not going to read out these two fab humans' bios because there's nothing worse than somebody telling our own stories. I'm going to ask them to tell a little bit of their stories. Um, I'm also going to ask them to talk about their ambitions and what their experience of Davos was, in, was. And the last is a message to business. Now, get your questions on, because we're going to give you a little room, if you're interesting, at the end to ask us questions. So I'm going to begin. Um, to my left is Eddie Nobadu, and to my right is Molly Burke. And I'm going to ask both of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves um, so that we can get to know you and everybody else watching online. So Eddie, do you want to start? Absolutely. Well, first of all, let me just say, I am thrilled to be on this panel and I really want to just take a moment to salute you, Carolyn. Thank you for amplifying our voices and for putting disability at the forefront of the global agenda. What you are doing is demonstrating to the business elite, to political leaders, that people with disabilities are here to stay. We're not going anywhere. And we are here to demonstrate to all of you that we have enormous capacity for leadership, that we are able to not only contribute to our workplaces and our societies, but also help shape the trajectory of humanity. So I am Eddie Ndopu. I am a 29-year-old activist and humanitarian. I serve as one of Mr. Antonio Guterres's 17 global advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals. I am also the first African with a disability to graduate from the University of Oxford. And I am on a mission to ensure that nobody gets left behind, particularly people with disabilities, and that we are able to make a dent uh, on extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change by the year 2030. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> like ambition? No big deal. Like, like, no big Whatever. deal. But just give some stats for those of you who don't know. It's 1.3 billion people who have a lived experience of disability. 80% yeah. is acquired between the ages of 18 and 64. So I'm going to turn to Molly in a second. And also 80% of disability is invisible. If you have a mum and a dad who love all of us, I am registered blind as well. That is 54% of our consumer base. So now I'm going to turn to Molly Burke. 
Molly, tell us a little bit about your story and this whole, tell us your story about how you came to terms or acquired your disability. Yes, so uh, you, I'm up here with two of my favorite people, three of my favorite people. <laughs> this is Gallup, uh, This by is the way. Gallup, <laughs> very important member of this panel. He has a lot to say on this topic. Um, so my name is Molly Burke. Uh, I am pretty much completely blind, although I might not look like it, which we'll get into later, don't worry. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I like to say that the disability community is one of the only minority groups or the only minority group that anybody can join at any point in their life. Yeah. Uh, as Caroline just said, majority of disabled people weren't born that way. And in my case, uh, I wasn't diagnosed with my disease until I was four years old. And my disease, retinitis pigmentosa, took my sight when I was 14 years old. And, you know, at that time, I went through severe depression. Uh, I lost all of my friends, was severely bullied, um, and, you know, thankfully I went on the long journey of recovery to be where I am today. I am now a YouTuber with uh, almost three million followers across platform. Thank you. <laughs> nice, yes. <laughs> um, I am an author of a best-selling book. It's not what it looks like. Uh, I am a motivational speaker. Uh, I've traveled the world with uh, some of some of the people that are here uh, at WEF, um, speaking to audiences as large as 20,000 at a time. And I'm a commercial model working with incredible diverse brands like Dove and American Eagle and Samsung. And I'm really pleased to be here to share some of my experiences and perspectives on such an important topic. Now, seriously, <laughs> this is talent, uh, this is leadership. So I'm gonna start with, what, a, okay, who, who do you wanna start with? What is your one thing that you want to do to, in the global context of disability and changing? What is, what is, what is your, both your passion points? Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about representation, so who wants to jump in? How we're seen and, how, and how, how people think about us? Well, I have long said that those that came before me um, have fought really hard. Disabled people have fought really hard for legal recognition, for human rights. Uh, for people with disabilities. And I think the next frontier for the disability movement is to actually think about what does accessibility look like beyond the built environment? What does it look like beyond legislation? How do we ensure that we move beyond zero? And zero for me is a signifier for compliance. Yeah. There's a compliance logic that seems to underpin all of the conversations when it comes to disability. Is there a ramp? Is there a sign language interpretation? Is there braille? But what happens once we're in the building? What happens once we're in spaces? Is our humanity adequately affirmed? Is our talent adequately affirmed? And so my vision globally is to ensure that we move the discourse beyond zero. We go beyond compliance, we go beyond rhetoric, and we affirm and validate the genius and the brilliance of people with disabilities everywhere. The way that I intend doing that is by, by becoming the first physically disabled person to go to space. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Loving you. And, <laughs> and I'm delighted to confirm that uh, on the eve of my participation here in Davos, it was announced globally um, that I will be, that I've just secured a zero gravity flight um, and I will be going weightless in May of this year. And in so doing, yeah. showing the world that, you know, we, we, we defy gravity. We defy gravity, that's what we do. We defy the odds, we defy gravity. And so it is a symbolic victory for people with disabilities, but specifically people with disabilities from where I come from, the continents of Africa, to show that those of us that are on the margins of society have within us enormous capacity to transform the world. And so that's, that's it's about changing the world in real time. You know, I used to think I was ambitious riding elephants <laughs> across India and a horse across Colombia. And it's nothing, but I, can I just say, is the first thing that everybody asks you mm. when you talk about this zero flight space, do they go, do they kind of look at you and go, 
like, are you physically going to be able to do that? Do you get a lot of that? I get that all the time. And it, it it's an interesting one because I think people do a lot of adventurous things. People throw themselves out of planes. People, um, you know, ride motorbikes. People do all of these things. But nobody really asks um, non-disabled people, um, are, are, are you sure you can do that? Or are you, are, are you healthy enough? Are you fit enough? Are you, I, I, I am, I am. And, and I go through the same rigor, the same process that anybody else would. And I think if there is a segment of society that is most capable of being able to do yeah. all of these weird and wonderful things, it's us, yeah. because we possess enormous resilience. We have, we have tenacity, because that is what is required to live on a day-to-day -day basis. The resourcefulness that we need in order to step out of our homes and confront the world on a day-to-day -day basis and hold our heads high, that takes guts. And so guts is the prerequisite for space travel. I think to your point, uh, people asking, sorry, I just... No, I'm they come on, because I'm just sitting here going, yes, yes. Yeah. But, you know, people don't ask able-bodied people, well, can you do that? I right. think I think society loves to decide our limitations for us, right. yeah. Decides loves to decide what we're capable of for yeah. us, instead of just realizing that we live our life, we right. know what we're yep. capable of, and right. if we're not capable, we'll ask for help, we'll let you know, we're the first to raise our hand, right. because we live life every single day having to constantly advocate for ourselves. Right. So believe me, if there's something I can't do, I'm gonna be the first to put my hand up and say it. And Molly, I don't you find that like, it? there's also, I, I think the lived experience of disability requires creativity, enormous creativity. My mom always says raising me was right. the most creative job in the world. Right. Because <laughs> you constantly, <laughs> best mom over there, she's incredible, and it's exactly that, it's a creative life. Yeah. It forces you to think outside the box every single day. But I think one of the things that, when we were talking before we're coming in, mm -hmm. is this perception of what disability is. And I'm just gonna talk about something controversial that happens, and yeah. I'm gonna hand over to you, because it links into representation. Yes. So we had the panel that announced the Valuable 500 on Tuesday. And yeah. I'm not going to say who, but well, there was a, one or two tweets that came out afterwards. And they were like, well, it would be great if there were some actual people with disabilities on that panel. And Eddie and I are sitting on that panel. <laughs> right? And I'm serious. And then somebody went back and said, well, <laughs> Eddie and Caroline. And then the person, well, she's not blind enough. And I'm going to turn to Molly on this, because this is something that we spoke about. Wow, the voice is wobbling here. Um, First thing is often people say, well, if you're blind, why are you wearing heels? Mm -hmm. Molly, will you just talk to me a little bit about representation and what your big ambition is? And I think you've been trolled, haven't you, about are you, bl are you really well, there's blind? There's entire forums <laughs> devoted to me faking blind on the internet, trust me. It's, uh, it's a constant question I get daily. Um, growing up, I dreamed of working in the entertainment industry. I don't work in this industry because I am, am just trying to break barriers for my community. I work in this industry because this is my passion. This is the industry I've always loved and always dreamed of being a part of. I was just five years old when I told my mom and dad that I was gonna move to Hollywood and be an actress. So we have so is, astronaut and actress. <laughs> this, you know, this, is, this is my passion and so I was never gonna let anything stop it. That being said, at that time that I said that, I didn't, I didn't know that I was gonna go blind. I didn't have any uh, understanding of what going blind meant for how society would then view me and treat me. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I did go blind at 14, I did give up on that dream. I thought, I can't be an actress, I can't be a model. People like me don't exist in Hollywood. We're not cast, we're not hired, we're not seen. And not only did that squash my dream, I also began to see how not having people like me in media, whether it be in you know scripted or in commercial um, marketing, not having people like me accurately represented meant that society now viewed me and treated me differently because whenever they did see me represented, it was in inauthentic, inaccurate, and often done by able-bodied people impersonating us, which frankly is the blackface we still allow. It's okay for able-bodied people to play disabled people. Right. That's the blackface we still allow in media. So for me, I constantly grew up with people saying I was faking it. I didn't look blind uh, because I love makeup, I love tattoos, I love room decor, I love fashion. 
Uh, you know, my eyes are green. All the reasons that people have been able to come up with for me not being blind. And it all draws back to what they've seen in movies uh, and in television is yep. blind people wear dark sunglasses. Blind people, you know, wouldn't care about the visuals, um, aesthetics that, you know, blind people are incapable, that we rely on other people to help us. Blind people have gray, foggy, glassed over eyes. Well, sure, there's certain people who have diseases like cataracts that cause that, but I don't have that. My disease affects the inside of my eye, and I can tell you this, if you look at the inside of my eye, it's all sorts of messed up. Uh, it just doesn't appear it on the outside. And so that's the real issue with, with the lack of representation is it affects us in real time every single day. Right. Uh, how do you feel about that, Eddie? What do you think about the issue of representation? I mean, if we're talking about labels, you tick a few boxes. Yeah. Here. Tick boxing, right? Let's I call honest. myself a kaleidoscope. You are. <laughs> what, how do you feel about that? How do you think about representation from your perspective? Well, I, I, I mean, I completely agree with what Molly just said. I, I think that, I think that we, you know, you know, we talk about intersectionality. It's this buzzword <laughs> that people yeah. love sort of banding about, but actually intersectionality is more than just gluing together lots of identities. It's more than that. It's about having multiple worldviews, multiple experiences at the same time. And that needs to be celebrated because all of us embody a multiplicity of experiences at the same time. We are never just one thing. We are many things all of the time at the same time. So it's very weird for me when people try to sort of compartmentalize me. I am physically disabled, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm all of these things at the same time. And so, uh, it, it, so even from a policy standpoint, why is it that we compartmentalize mm. Uh, when in actual fact we need to affirm the fact that we embody all of these identities at the same time. And so I think culture plays a very important role. Um, I think that there is, sure, legal recognition is, is incredibly important, but where the tipping point happens is when we see diverse and nuanced and complicated depictions of the lives of people with disabilities in all of our splendor and in all of our glory. So it is about Hollywood, it is about the magazines, it is about the rooms that we sort of find ourselves in, like the ones here at the World Economic Forum in Davos. All of these things matter because you can't become what you don't see. Like, couldn't agree, and like from your perspective, Molly, you've been talking about this, about what you don't see, but you, you've just said, like, you love fashion and beauty. And so, where are you going? What's your next kind of career ambition? What, what are you gonna do for the next few years? Like. Yeah, I mean, the, the beauty and fashion industry, as I said, I, I grew up dreaming of being an actress and a model, and the beauty and fashion industry is, is initially what got me into YouTube as a viewer. I fell in love with the beauty and lifestyle and fashion community on YouTube because I didn't have friends anymore in real life. I, you know, I'm 14, 15 years old, I find myself blind, lost all my friends, and I turned to the girls on YouTube because I didn't have girls to go shopping with. I didn't have girls to have sleepovers with and talk about boys with and all these things. So I found these girls online that were just like me, had the same passions and interests. And although they weren't blind, I connected with them on my passions. And so that's what got me into the YouTube world. And, and then, you know, five, six years later, I began my own channel. And of course, because I'm passionate about it, I talk on my channel a lot about beauty and a lot about fashion as a disabled woman, yes, but just as a woman mm. who loves it. And one of the things that is, is a constant frustration for me is that it's the one industry that I feel like has denied me being a part of it the most. Mm. What, what do you mean? Um, I mean, look, you, you're, you're modeling, so what do you mean they, they've denied I'm you? modeling for brands that use real women. <laughs> I model for brands that are like, <laughs> we have representation, and don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for the opportunities that they've allowed me okay. and that they care, but that shouldn't be the exception. That shouldn't be the tagline of a marketing campaign. That should be the norm. And so for me, yeah, I've had two to three brands that have been like, come on board. We love representation, um, but for the most part, overall, as particularly beauty, you know, I've is is closed the door in my face. Um, not just uh, 
you know, it's, it's funny, all these magazines, they do these big glossy things about me, like beauty influencer, but I don't think any other beauty YouTuber would ever invite me into their circle or call me a beauty YouTuber. Um, I'm so lucky that Allure Magazine has really kind of fought in my corner and they've done, you know, a massive spread on me. They've done videos with me. Um, and, you know, Allure Magazine, I think ar arguably is the biggest beauty specific yep. magazine, beauty centric magazine. And so realistically, that's where all the beauty brands are looking for, you know, what's happening, what's hot, what's yep. interesting, yep. what's new on the scene. And, uh, you know, a number of brands reached out after the big spread and were like, hey, we'd like love to send you like a box of products. And it's like, okay, um, <laughs> pay me and let's work together. Uh, right. I don't just need your free PR. I have enough money to buy your products. Thank you. But uh, like, let's work together. And every time that conversation comes, they just shut the door. They act like I'm just so lucky to be in their presence. I'm not lucky to be here. I deserve to be here because I've worked for it. And I'm val as valuable to you as you are to me. I bring a unique and different perspective to an industry that's been walking the same circle for years. Yeah. Um, in, in an industry that's been called you know, shallow and, and all of these things, I bring the perspective of it's not what it looks like, which happens to be the name of my best-selling book. But um, I, I bring the perspective of actually fashion and beauty run deeper than the aesthetics. Yeah. Fashion and beauty are about self-expression, about creativity, about right. yeah. confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's a story worth telling, and I have the most authentic way to tell that. But every brand likes to close the door on my face and say, well, for example, let me just give you some examples of what specific beauty brands have said. I won't name and shame, but we've had brands say things to my manager like, well, if we put her on our billboard, nobody will see that she's a minority. Are you kidding me? You, so you're yeah, blatantly to saying it's tokenism. You would only use me for tokenism. Mm -hmm. We've had brands say, well, she's not a professional makeup artist. Cool. Half the other YouTubers you work with aren't either. And it doesn't affect your ability to work with them. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, she's just not, she's not, you know, accessible to everybody. Not everybody could relate to her lived experiences. Well, that's why it's an important experience to share. So it's really crazy the things that... But I think, I think we have to accept where it is, and I, and I think it's great having you getting up and speaking about it, because that will change it. And if we move then from beauty through to representation and accessibility, and I think what Eddie wants to do, I'd just like you to talk about the Global Access Fund, because yeah. access, as you're speaking about, it's not just about ramps, it's about the six inches right. between our, our, our ears, right? I mean, this is about how right. is our accessible or inclusive is our mind. Right. So from Molly's perspective, she's talking about representation through beauty, but can you give us what your big challenge and what you want to do? And listen, there's people here in this room and outside this room who could help you with your insanely ambitious right. target. Do you want to tell us? Sure. So when I was appointed by the Secretary General of the UN to serve as an advocate for the SDGs, I really reflected on how could I use my platform to ensure that we're able to promote accessibility globally and that it becomes part and parcel of the UN's global agenda, but also humanity's global agenda. And one of the things I realized is that um, there is no umbrella fund, a global fund, that involves both public and private sector to come together and put capital behind the collective commitment to ensure that accessibility becomes real for people with disabilities. So and what do you mean by that? Explain what you mean by accessibility, just for people that don't know, because they might think it's just ramps. Right. No, for, by accessibility, we're talking about the entire value chain. Everything from getting... It, we're talking about the built environment, so infrastructure, ensuring that people have adequate transit, that people have adequate accommodation so that they can get from point A to point B and actually ex exercise their freedom of movement. We're speaking about access to financial security. For example, we always speak about the relationship between poverty and disability. Yeah. We never speak about the link between financial security and disability, or dare I say, wealth and disability which is just yeah. absolutely mind boggling. So the vision for this Global Access Fund is to be able to mobilize $1 billion to ensure that we're able to scale existing initiatives around accessibility in service 
of the 1.3 billion people of dis with disabilities living on the planet today. So it's about bringing together private sector and public, uh, uh, and the private and the public sector to ensure that we can institutionalize accessibility. So any large scale infrastructure project that's happening in the world needs to think about accessibility from the beginning, from the outset. I, on the African continent, we have something called Agenda 2063, which is a blueprint, a vision of what the continent would look like by the year 2063. From an urban planning perspective, how do we ensure that people with disabilities are not as an afterthought, but front and center yeah. of all of the large scale investments that happen? So my vision for this global fund is that it will help to bridge the access gaps and deploy capital and funding where it's required so that accessibility becomes part and parcel of all of our investments and, and, and our uh, global development um, objectives. Right. Um, <clears throat> so you can see uh, the energy and the ambition here. Um, would anybody like to ask a question? Because I've got uh, loads of questions that I want to continue to ask. But I must remember, I can't really see you guys. But is there anybody out here who would like to ask a question of Eddie and Molly? Um, and somebody give me a time check as well, because I can't obviously see any watches or timings. Olivia, how much more do we have? Oh, great. OK, so does, any, um, so does anybody want to ask a question before I dive into more? Because I will. Hands, anyone? Seriously, this is a conversation for all of us. And I think everybody's very comfortable to ask anything, right? You guys, yeah, totally. we're here to ask any questions. Yeah. People on the internet don't hold back. I've heard it all. Hi, Molly. <laughs> Juanpa here. Hi. Mexican friend. So I was listening to what you were saying about all of this, about working with brands. And more of a question I would like to share some experience as a YouTuber, too. Um, I think the best way for brands to see the value is to do what you're already doing, which is paving the way. I think you need to understand that you are stepping into the unknown and you are being the first one on carrying that torch and you are being the concept that is proving that it works. So of course it's being tough because you are the only one building this tunnel, right? So all I can say is congratulations and keep doing it because I promise you that those brands that see the value will come. Oh, thank you. Do you want to try? No, I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the ones who do see my value because they don't treat me like I'm lucky and I'm very grateful for that. They see that I'm actually doing something important. Yeah. Um, so I'm absolutely so grateful and I'm so grateful to have been one of the first disabled YouTubers because... But you made your luck, Molly. Yeah. Can I just, can yeah. I just say that for a okay. second? You made your luck. Nobody gave this to you on the plate. You went out and fought for it. You did too. Like, you, you guys made and pushed your luck. Why do you, where do you think you got that energy? Is it from your parents, of which both our mums are here, so are in the yes. audiences? Um, and I have, great, I have great parents as well. Do you, where do you think you both got that? Like, you didn't get this on a plate, either of you. I think um, when every day the world still fights against you, the only way to keep going is, is to have the fight back. And I don't mean fight in a negative way of, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't walk around every day going, I'm so oppressed. <laughs> it's not about that. But, you know, often with, with being in the entertainment industry, I hear things like, oh, don't get cocky, don't get full of yourself. And I always just say to them, it's, it's really hard to get full of yourself when every day you are still discriminated against and every day you are still judged. Um, and I think the best example of that is I was in an Oscars commercial with Samsung, and I think anybody in this room can recognize that being in an Oscars commercial is a, a big step in a career in the entertainment industry. And I was at this Oscars party, and we're watching the commercial, and we're celebrating, we're so excited. And then I leave the party, and I'm denied access to a vehicle home because of my guide dog. And in that moment, it doesn't matter that I was just in an Oscars commercial. What matters is I'm being denied a basic human right. And that happens daily still for, I'd say, all of us. And so when that is your reality, you don't have, you have two options in life. You have the option to stay home, to hide yourself away from the world, to cry, to be bitter, to be depressed, to be angry, or you fight. 
you fight for change, you fight for acceptance. Um, and I did the angry, depressed, why me laying in my bed thing when I went blind. And you can only live that for so long before you decide, is this it? Or do I give it one more go? And, and I was at the point of saying, that's, this is it. And I'm lucky that people stepped in and gave me the support and helped me build myself up. And I just remember being 15 years old and turning to my mom and I said, I can't be angry at society's ignorance if I'm not willing to do something to educate society. Yeah. And it was then that I knew that I had to dedicate my life to fighting for our community, mm, right. to fighting for change. It's so interesting listening to you, what? 20 years younger than me, and I, I, I really can feel that, you know, the time that you have to take accountability and responsibility for your lived experience and not wait for magic to, to fix you or, yeah. or make it easier. And Eddie, for you, I, you have a very different experience to Molly. Um, you got to Oxford. You, you, you think about, you were in Dreamforce in, in November. You, you're setting up a billion dollar campaign. Where, where does this come from? Where was your, that kind of, as I call it, snot rock moment where you had, or did you have one where you had to pick yourself back up? I mean, can you explain a little bit to us about your story from that perspective? I think that it's never just one moment. I, I, I think it's, it's about a process of becoming. Success is about process of becoming. It's not a state of being. It's not a fixed point that we sort of find ourselves in and then wake up and say, oh, wow, I, I feel like I've overcome everything. It's, it's a daily battle and a daily struggle. And I think for me, I, I've been accused of dis disability exceptionalism, right? So the idea You mean that, like a super crip? Is right, that exactly, they, they right. They call so super crips? Right, super crip. Super crip. The idea that, you know, disabled people need to be superhuman for for our humanity to be affirmed, right? That we need to sort of like go far above and beyond. And I understand that and, and, and there's a legitimate argument to be made there, but what I am advocating for is space and freedom for disabled people to be exceptional. So we have the right to be ordinary, but we also yes. have the right yes. to be extraordinary. Yeah. We can be extraordinary and that is a legitimate right that I am fighting for and so, my life is really about that. It's about showing the world that, it, that disability and living an extraordinary life can go hand in hand. And, and so I think that reminder is what keeps me going and what forces me to keep fighting for a world that goes beyond compliance, a world that goes beyond the minimum threshold that we are told to accept and be happy with. I want to go back to a moment where we were at young, One Young World. Mm. And I know you wanted to desperately meet Richard Branson. Yeah. Because about space. Can you just, just, you know, I think, I love the fact that we're sitting here going, you've got a right to be ordinary, you've got a right to be angry, you've got a right to be normal, you've got a right to be sad, you've got a right to be happy, you've got a right to be emotional. Actually, that's an invitation to all human beings. It's right. nothing to do with disability, right? Mm -hmm. This is, these issues we're talking about are emotional, they're belonging. Right. But I think one of the things I saw in you that day was just that moment of meeting somebody that you wanted to meet, but not because you want to meet Richard Branson, but do you want to talk about that? Because it, yeah. it was extraordinary. It, it, it was extraordinary. I, I had no idea whether it would actually happen. <laughs> and we were in the same building. Richard Branson was upstairs. Somebody sort of tipped us off and said yeah. that he's upstairs. So we left everything that we were doing. We went into the elevator. We sort of negotiated Liked our way through. Our way. <laughs> through security and found ourselves in the same room as him. And I remember it so clearly, Caroline, he, he walked towards us and it was this out of body experience and, and you intro introduced me and, and I, I don't even remember everything I said, but it, was, it wasn't even about no. the meeting. I think it was an affirmation in that moment that, wow, it is possible, it yeah. really is possible yeah. that we can find ourselves in the same spaces and we can show up and rise to the occasion when the moment demands of it. 
I think it was for us because it was like a visually impaired person with right. Eddie and we were running around in and out of doors and then slammed into Richard <laughs> Branson. Um, for your, that was a big dream for you. And, yeah. and I, I, I really think everybody needs to keep an eye on this, this gentleman because it's the 23rd of May or around May. Yeah. That is his yeah. first zero, 23rd of May. zero gravity flight. But we have another um, ambitious uh, traveler here. What, listen, I love cars and motorbikes and now you're taking over. What is this thing you have with cars? And, and what are we looking for here? I think because visually impaired people driving. Come on, give us yes. this. Okay, uh, well, not just visually impaired, pretty much totally blind. It's yeah, no, you, sorry, blind. yes. <laughs> apologies, yeah. apologies, wrong, uh, wrong language. I think you and I know uh, the same, ex we have the same experience, and that is when you are blind, I think every blind person can join me in saying that it is the number one moment of being like, oh my God, I'm not gonna drive. That yeah. is like, that is the thing. That is the pinnacle of being like, oh yeah, the hardest part of blind, like I can't drive. It's one of those frustrations because it's that thing we all look forward to when we're turning 16 or 15 or 17, whatever it is in your country, where you get to like get your license and you have that freedom and you're going into adulthood. And you know, we don't, we don't get that moment. And um, that's a big part of growing up and realizing what your future holds as a blind person. And so for me, um, as a YouTuber, I'm constantly thinking, you know, I put out two videos a week, I'm constantly thinking of content and ideas and ways in which that I can not just make content that's entertaining, but content that's impactful. And I do a lot of content around, you know, trying to achieve dreams and goals um, and overcoming challenges and I thought of this series and the biggest challenge in accomplishing the series is that I ultimately need a, a sponsorship, a partner in the car industry to come in on this. Um, I need to find my Richard Branson. <laughs> so if anybody knows anybody, hook me up. But um, basically the concept is uh, I wanna be a blind girl who buys and drives my own car and uh, I'll give you the context because that sounds crazy and dangerous. Um, fun. But, uh, fun, exactly. For You and I are like, fun! Everybody else is like, terrifying, get me off the road. Um, so basically, you know, most of my audience is 18 to 35. They're in that prime car shopping buying age. So I want to go on that experience with them. I want to do something that I and society never thought I would. I want to go to car dealerships and, and learn about cars. What's a car loan? What is, you know, what's financing it versus a loan versus leasing? Um, you know, I want to see like, what, what should you look for? What, is, you know, gas admissions, all these things that we look for in our first car. Um, for me, it would be, does my guide dog fit? That's a real, real challenge with the 95 pound dog. And then, you know, picking my car, buying my car, getting it all customized and swagged out, and then going to the Salt Flats in Utah, where it is fully legal for blind Would people you come to drive awesome. as fast as they freaking want. <laughs> and I want to floor it in my pink car. And I want to do that because, and I, and I want to, and people are like, well, why don't you just get a car and drive it? Like, why do you have to like own your own car? And I, because, I'm a lady boss, yes. and I can own my own car, nice. and somebody else that. can drive me around in it. <laughs> and I want to show people that there's all of these challenges that everybody's going to face in life, and there's these things that society will tell us we can't do, and we will tell ourselves we can't do. But you just have to find a way around it. So can I buy and drive my own car? Yes, in the salt flats, but not in everyday life. But in everyday life, you know, I have a full-time assistant that works for me that currently drives me to all my events, you know, in her car. Why can't she drive me in my, my car? car right. Because my I'm an car. empowered woman who runs a business and deserves to have my beautiful swagged out pink car and be driven around. So that is my I car series that. dream. So, so, oh, wow. car, so what is your version of the pink out swag car? What's yours? Yeah, no, seriously. But what's your version of it? So what is your version of the pink out swag card that they say that you can't have because you happen to be wheelchairs? What is your version of that? Come on. Oh my God. I mean, you can't so have a blip in spaceship, okay? That's maybe pushing a bit far. What is your version? Actually, maybe not with you. If I mean, <laughs> don't tell them that. No, that's what I say. No, no, it's, no, it's, I was like, okay. I'm like, mm, actually. Um, look, I, I, I mean, it's not just one thing. I mean, there's so many things. I, 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 
my dream always is to sort of have my own penthouse, you know, sort of overlooking uh, Sorry, a beautiful... Sorry, just slowly, your own penthouse? Go on. Overlooking, having the most extraordinary view. And I already have a name for the residence. It's going to be called Cloud Nine, et cetera. <laughs> anyway, that, that that's... Is, a, that's a, there's a reality right, show happening that, that, right here. It's, it's a very specific dream, but I, I think... I'm you know, right there on that dream right? with you, Eddie. Right, I am like right, I'm nine. the penthouse beside yours. Right? <laughs> Um, and, and, but, but I think really what we're both saying is that it, it, it's about allowing us the space and the freedom to be whoever we want to be, to be able to harness our imagination in service of not only improving our own lives, but using yes. our lives to be able to impact our communities, our countries, our societies, the globe at large. And so it, 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 some people might see it as, as trivial or insignificant, but it's not. It, uh, it, beneath that, what underpins yeah. these dreams and these visions and these desires, I think is a profound recognition of our inherent worth as people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, go. I was gonna say, I, I think uh, I can speak for all three of us having known the two of you quite a while now and worked with you guys in the past at One Young World, and is that um, for people like us, no is is almost like our favorite word mm. because Bring no no right. is a challenge. No is a yes I can. That's a day. Uh, no to me is fuel. Yeah. And often because I work, you know, in the social media industry, hate is part and parcel. It comes along with putting yourself online for the world to to look at. And so I get asked a lot, how do you deal with hate and negativity and trolls and haters? And I'm like, oh man, that doesn't bring me down. That pushes me forward. Right. Give me the fuel for my fire because you're no, you're hate, you're no, you can't, uh, you shouldn't, you, you aren't enough is me being like, okay, get ready. Right. That's the next on my list. Watch me do it. Yeah. Well, okay, we have a very few minutes left and there's two things I actually want to ask both of you to think about. One mm -hmm. is I want you to think about what you're going to say to business leaders out there because we've got it we've got another eight months to close our valuable 500 to unga who are i hope you guys are going to join me back on the stage again Absolutely. but that's our last question but i want to i'm sitting here thinking we're very privileged mm -hmm. the three of us are very privileged we had great families we've had great education and we are the lucky ones yep. also i think words that the people that kick around with us is that we're inspiring which i i would have to say we really hate, right? Yeah. The, you know, no, nobody would say who lives with us that we're inspiring. But we are, uh, no, really, they wouldn't. Um, uh, but for yes. those of, we're sitting here in one of the most, you know, whatever platforms up a mountain with snow and this, with these great, with education and family and support. What is it that you both want to see for those who have not had the luck that we've had? Or what do you think is, is there one or two things that you could say? And this is why I think this business piece is so important. How can we help rise the tide for everyone? I mean, all of our work is doing that. I, I'm not saying that, but can we just think for a second from this place that we are so lucky to be in? Because if I had been born in a country in, in Africa, yeah. I would be killed because my condition. Yeah. So just, we were lucky. So can I just ask you just to, just to speak to that just before we close and to the business question? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I often say that, you know, the Maslow hierarchy of needs, we, we, we need to kind of flip it on its head. We need to start with self-actualization and affirm the dignity and the inherent worth of people with disabilities everywhere. That, that is just as important as advocating for a roof over one's head and all of the basic building blocks that constitute the international development space. And we need to recognize that behind all of the statistics that we throw around, 90% of children with disabilities have never seen the inside of a classroom, that behind those statistics are real lives with aspirations, with hopes, with fears, with anxieties, with dreams. And so I think we need to tell those stories and we need to amplify the voices of the people that live those experiences. And then my message to business leaders, it's a no-brainer. It's 2020. And if any CEO is really committed to innovation and growth, look no further than disability because disability is a site of innovation and people with disabilities are incredibly talented. And that is the next frontier. That is what is required for the world to become better, is to involve and include the 1.3 billion people with disabilities living on the planet today. Yeah. 
Molly, uh, to your question from this place of very uh, luck that we were born into, um, give your perspective and also your yeah. message to business leaders about closing this loop. So I think to your point that none of us like the word inspiring, uh, we're not inspiring for living. That's what humans do. We live life to the fullest. And that's what we're doing every day. And I often get comments on my videos, wow, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't live if I went blind. I would just want to die. I would rather die than go blind. And I think that really speaks to the way the world is taught to view disability. We're taught to view disability as the worst possible thing in life. We'd rather die than be disabled. Um, and I always just say, actually, you could live like this because when life doesn't give you an option, you just do. And life didn't give us an option. This is the hand we were dealt. And so we're just doing it and we're playing the cards well. And we're doing that because like you said, Caroline, we had incredibly supportive families. We were born into the right country, the right time, the right place. I often think about the fact that, you know, everybody's excited about how far and fast technology is moving. For our community, 40 to 50 years ago, we would have been taken away from our families and segregated and put in, in you know, homes where we would have not have been given access to opportunity, to education. Uh, we wouldn't have been empowered in any way. And that still happens in certain places in the world. And that's what we're fighting for. And that's what we need to see change. Um, as I said earlier, disability is the only minority group that anybody in this room can join at any time in their life. So it's really of everybody's best interest to care about accessibility. And um, you know, I, I think most of us in this room have probably heard it, the curb cut phenomenon. Accessible design is really universal design. Yeah. It's not just for those of us with disabilities, it's something that benefits everybody. The curb cut was designed for people in wheelchairs. Now the curb cut is vital for all of us riding bikes, pushing baby strollers, skateboarding, dragging our suitcases. And that's just one small example of the world thinking about designing for us. Mm -hmm. And it's really for all of us because it's not us and them, it's us. Yeah. We're all in this world together. There's 1.3 billion of us and that number isn't gonna go anywhere. We can't focus on curing us, changing us. We focus on embracing us as we are. Uh, you know, what we need businesses to do is to step up, we need an accessibility officer who is going to be empowered and supported to create change within organizations. We need organizations to commit to hiring and including people with disabilities within their organization and within their consumer base with who they're marketing and creating product for. Um, so this is, this is what we need companies to step up and do. This is why the Valuable 500 is so important and what they are doing matters. Absolutely. Um, and, and as I said, it is truly in everybody's best interest. Like Eddie said, disabled people are who you want on your team. We are some of the most hardworking, creative, ambitious people who overcome daily, uh, who often have to think creatively and outside of the box. And if you don't want people like that on your team, I don't know who you want on your team. Gallop's awoken from his nap. He's like, are we done? So I, I would just want to end with three things very quickly. Um, we would say we all fall to the, the social model of disability. I, off, I have a four and a half year old nephew who I go on my, you know, my knees to and I hold his shoulders and I look him in the face and I say, you are just good enough the way you are. And I want to believe that. This is not a conversation about disability, but actually the world is not designed for that sentiment. We are not disabled, and we would all believe the world is designed. To, it's the misdesign of the world. Mm -hmm. So we can design that out. So we can design out the disability. And, what, and not the disability we have, but we can design it to be accommodating. We can future-proof our world and our businesses. We can change bad habits of exclusion. It's habits of exclusion. And I just want to end by saying next year, wouldn't it be magnificent if we had Eddie speaking on a plenary panel about travel and space travel, and Molly speaking on a panel about fashion 
and not talking about disability, but giving their experience through the disability lens, wouldn't that be progress? So I just want to say I am going to intend to get you there. Um, I want to thank every one of you for joining us. I think there's something very special about this panel. I have such regard, and I please, um, we're going to stick around afterwards, but a huge round of applause for the World Economic Forum. Thank you. Thank you again. You keep doing this. Let's keep building on it. But to the gorgeous and wonderful-hearted Molly Burke and Eddie Nobody. Thank you.